<laughs> at the state level. Uh, so Jason, maybe I'll just give you the floor. I want to introduce uh, the gentleman, the young lady there. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Jason Smith, and I just wanted a director of uh, Mike Batista from Corrections is here. We're, we're here to present to the State Tribal Relations Committee uh, along with uh, Adrian Slaughter, who is the Government Relations Director from Corrections, and also Harlem Trombley, who is our American Indian Liaison. Uh, we're here to just kind of say hi, and um, I wanted Mike Director Batista to be able to introduce himself and kind of talk about some of the efforts that he is leading in terms of uh, corrections. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jason. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Thank you, members. Uh, sorry for the interruption of your meeting. Um, we were in town and thought it would be a great opportunity to kind of share with you what our, our department's working on. Uh, as Jason said, my name is Mike Batiste. I'm the Director of Corrections. Uh, been in the position for about a year, was appointed by Governor Bullock. And then prior to that, I served 20 years mm -hmm. um, under three attorneys generals, including uh, Governor Bullock when he was attorney general at Department of Justice. So I ran the Division of Criminal Investigation for the department for 20 years. And then prior to that, I was with the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration. I'm originally from Great Falls. Um, I'll tell you a little bit, of, 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 of just very briefly, about some of the things that we have going on that I think are important. Um, for you to know in the department. Um, first, a lot of people, I think, when they think of the Department of Corrections, they think primarily about the prison. Um, a lot of people asked me when I got the job if I was going to be moved to Deer Lodge, but there's so much more about the Department of Corrections. We have five secure facilities. We have two adult secure facilities. We have two youth secure facilities. And then we have about 17 different community corrections programs. Um, treatment programs, assessment sanction centers, free release centers, and then we have about 26 probation and parole offices around the state. Um, our focus, even though I come from a law enforcement background and was a kind of a tough on crime cop for a, for a long time, I do realize that you know we need to really help the offenders throughout Montana transition into their communities once they're released from prison or community corrections. So I think the most exciting thing that we're working on is our reentry program, um, and, and that is figuring out ways to help inmates, offenders transition into their communities because 97% of all offenders go back to their communities at some point. So if they don't have the, the right skills, they're not going to be successful. They're going to create more victims. Uh, they're going to recidivate, and they're going to come back to prison. And everybody knows that the cost of prisons are unbelievable in this country. So. We're going to try real hard in the next several years to make sure our reentry efforts are successful, that, that offenders have education, that they can be reunited with their family, that they've gone through and been successful in, in some of the treatment programs that we provide. So we're really going to make an effort to do that. Our last reentry meeting, and we have representatives from a lot of different agencies, um, our last reentry meeting had some Native American representatives that talked about their hope for reentry, what they think works, getting people back to 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 their um, tribal community so that they can be successful. So we're going to try and incorporate some of the best practices in tribal reentry to try and make that more effective. Because I think that everybody knows that, or should know, that um, tribal offenders are over overrepresented in the corrections system. I think in secure facilities, prisons. It's about 20% of all the population, and I think in, if you add community corrections, which is pre-release treatment uh, sanction centers, it's about 17.5, I think, right, Adrian? Um, so those numbers are way too high, and so we've got to work to get that down. So that's, that's probably the most exciting thing that I think that we're doing, and I think that we have a lot of good momentum going. We have a task force in place, and I'm, I'm really a results-oriented guy, so I'm not going to meet and just keep meeting without actually accomplishing something. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about that. Um, and if you have any more interest in some of the DOC programs or what we're doing specifically on reentry, um, please let us know. We're happy to show that, share our ideas with you and ways to kind of get the population down because uh, prisons throughout the country are not growing. People are not investing more and more money in prisons. So we have to do the right thing and help people be successful. So we're, we're committed to that. So does anybody have anything, any questions I might be able to answer or comments? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I thought I saw a hand. 
There's a cup of coffee. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anybody have anything? If not, thanks for letting us interrupt your meeting. We appreciate it. Um, and again, if you have any questions or would like to know more about what we're doing, please uh, give us a call or let us know. We have a pretty good website that has a lot of information. So thank you. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else that wants to talk? Or see if you were... Okay. Well, thanks for coming, Jason, and giving a quick uh, heads up here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Time is now 10.30. I call this meeting to order. Um, Pat, what's your on that? Black Lodge, just here. Rice and Black Lodge. Stuart, Black Lodge. Reno, Reno Cowboys. Here. Eric, Burning Ground, Center Lodge. Tyson Grove Lodge, Lodge Grass, here. Alden, Big Horn, here. Cooler Gum, Big Horn. Spotted Horse, Big Horn. Here. Mighty few, good luck. Stuart, mighty few. Real bird, mighty few. Pull across with it, Chuck. 13 prison. There's a couple guys still on their way, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, next, uh, thank you. Judicial Branch for making your presence. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, judicial reports. And I'd like to give the floor to Chief Judge Not Afraid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Secretary, and members of the body. I would, to, I would like to, Mr. Speaker, with your permission to proceed forward and give a brief overview about the judicial branch and then bring the uh, branch up by departments. With your permission, Mr. Speaker. The floor is yours, Chief Judge. Thank you very much. Ilage a hallmark for the opportunity to be here this morning. I'm just going to give a brief overview about what we're doing at the branch. Then I will turn over the I will turn the floor over to the IT folks. They need to get back and continue their work. And then the acting court administrator, I'll introduce her then, and then she'll introduce the departments. Uh, because that is uh, what we have done. Uh, historically, in recent times, Senators, the Judicial Branch has had three judges sitting on one case. That is what our Judicial Docket tells us. And it created some confusion with reference to which judge was going to sit on which case. Also, we had clerks that were cross-referencing cases. A civil clerk would sit on a civil case 
but yet oftentimes they would sit on a criminal, and it created confusion. In the legal memorandum that was submitted by former legal counsel, uh, Senators, you'll, it'll be interesting to note that the formal, formal legal counsel that left this branch during the transition, currently our legal advisor, ad, advisor to the court is Mr. Bill Akers, and he's there for a period of 60 days until the end of transition. That's where we started. As soon as we walk through the doors, Judge covers up. Judge Not Afraid, myself, I announced as Chief Judge of the Judicial Branch a 60-day transition period. Formal, f former legal counsel uh, in the exiting memo that I had requested stated that the Judicial Branch is currently working on breaking the court into departments. I believe that had been going on, Mr. Speaker, for the last year or two. The good news is, gentlemen, that when we walked through the doors on December 3rd, we did it in two weeks. Currently, we've broken the, the court into three departments, criminal division, civil division, and juvenile. And the, there are specific clerks that we'll be introducing this morning that have been assigned to just one judge. And there's no confusion. We're moving forward. You'll be hearing about what we're, we're doing as a branch. There was a, a historical move on Friday by our criminal judge. Um, it's a real interesting story on Friday. Does it chill on? With reference to civil matters, You'll be hearing from the civil judge not afraid about what we are doing to handle matters the way they're supposed to be handled as a civil division. We're, we're moving toward handling matters where we're handing reins over to the right branch of government in, according, in accordance with the Crow Law and Order Code. Dela, Mr. Speaker. Uh, when speaking to you on Friday, I was not able to get a hold of um, Senator Goes Ahead. Um, with due respect to the Senators, uh, I know that uh, a financial report is traditionally presented during this time. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Secretary, members of the body, with your permission, I would like to have all the players at the same table when that financial report happens. The chairman of the committee, the secretary of the committee, the CPA, as well as uh, is Marlon Passes still finance director, as well as Marlon Passes, all the players at the same table with all the records in the spirit of transparency for you to see. I, I, today, I believe our goal is, and, and this is being real honest, Senators, we've been in office six weeks. I'm still learning about the budget. I'm still trying to track down expenditures and getting the books balanced. Uh, communication has go, gone to a whole new level with the finance department. We're working on getting things done expeditiously. We're following the model of this branch. We're following the model of what you do here. I think uh, before we stepped on board on December 3rd, the uh, elected officials were not looked at as elected officials, Mr. Speaker. And I believe that spirit of sovereignty that is in this branch with the senators and the body that's starting to grow with us at the judicial branch. So with that in mind, at this time, I believe Q&A will be at the end, Mr. Speaker, after all the departments are finished presenting. Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you.
At this time, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to introduce our IT folks who are our IT people during the transition period. Um, with your permission, can they approach Mr. Speaker? You have the floor, Chief Judge. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jeff Honkoop. I'm with Honkoop Technology Services. I've uh, met many of you before in this same forum. Uh, Brian Erickson is a member of my team, a business partner. Uh, we've been supporting the Tribal Corps for approximately the last 18 months, and almost exclusively for the last 12 months. And we've helped them with a number of key projects that the Chief Judge asked us to introduce to you. Uh, probably the most critical and important project that we've accomplished for the courts is the helping them identify and work through the implementation process of a complete video conferencing solution between the jail here in Crow Agency and the criminal courtroom and from the civil juvenile courtroom to the juvenile detention facility in Busby. Uh, the goal of that project was to reduce the risk of the risks associated with inmate transport and generally make the process of arraignment hearings easier. During the process of evaluating the systems that were there, we determined that they had some other ne needs and necessities that could benefit from the same teleconferencing system, same cameras, same monitors, in that they were currently doing video court capture of the courtrooms the same way you're doing them today in this, uh, in this room. They had a single camera, and they were catching one angle and manually managing it. Their new, their new system actually will have multiple camera angles and will be fully automated so that they capture not only the back of the head in this case, but the view of the judge and the view of any witnesses, as well as the remote participant. So it creates a scenario where they can be more effective and efficient as judges and as a, and as a <coughs> overall judicial department while still providing better transparency into what they're doing. Uh, in addition and to support of that, we've done some significant work upgrading the infrastructure of the court buildings, improving connectivity between all their workstations and the other systems because as we increase the capabilities, the requirements for the system improved also. Uh, the biggest benefit of all of this is just improved efficiencies inside their court system, inside your judicial branch, and the ability to be more transparent in its actions. Probably the best news of all is that it was all paid for with a uh, DOJ grant, which means that it didn't cost them directly, but you still see the benefits. Chief Judge Alfred? Correction on that. We are a branch of government. We're not a department. Sorry. It's all right. I, I won't cut your pay. I'm just kidding. Mr. Speaker, a little bit too serious, so I figured make it light, make it light. And uh, you gentlemen, if you need to get going, please do so. Thank you. At this time, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to introduce our acting court administrator who I, I think you know personally Mr. Speaker uh, acting court administrator Darlene O'Crow uh, the speaker has granted me discretion to go ahead and call the and also your co-presenters or co-presenter I believe there were some folks slated for presenting this morning but we needed to prepare for one o'clock uh, arraignment, so two of our staff members needed to go. And I'll turn the microphone over to your better half, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, may I begin? Proceed. Mr. Speaker O'Crow, Mr. Secretary Rilberg, members of the body, at this time I would like to thank this opportunity that you have given the judicial branch and that we're able to present uh, our report in each department is going to be getting up here and reporting on their department. 
Um, my report is going to include just briefly um, my duties, uh, a brief overview of the judicial branch and the changes that have occurred. Um, as as uh, Chief Judge mentioned, I'm acting court administrator. Um, that's temporary. I'm also taking care of the duties that I had before was, it, was as the assisting court administrator and court clerk and whatever else needed to be done, I did. And so those duties usually consisted of travel uh, timesheets, AP process, assisting with the clerks and judges, and, um, and purchases of equipment. And then the judicial branch, I know that the chief judge has already given you a brief overview of that, but we have the three departments, the criminal, the civil, and the juvenile department. And then we also have the probation officers, we have two. Um, we have healing to wellness, court with uh, Nancy Old Elk, and we have a juvenile probation officer also. Just recently during the spring, I believe, is when he came on to the judicial branch. And then we have um, our bailiff, process server, maintenance, and then our office manager is Dean Bird. Right now he had to go back because they had to process some paperwork for court. Uh, later on, like I said, each of the departments are going to get, give you a little bit more detail about their departments. And some of the changes so far uh, for since the last report uh, is that we have the two new elected judges. We have Chief Judge Not Afraid, Leroy Not Afraid, and Associate Judge Carrie Covers Up. And then we still, Sheila Not Afraid, is Judge Not Afraid is still there, so we have all three. And like he said, um, each judge is taking care of a department. And then we also have a new schedule that was effective January 1st of this year. And um, the handouts that we gave out, I don't know if they give it, have passed it out, but it's in there, the schedule. Um, we've modified it, so that's the new schedule for the courts, the juvenile, the civil, and the criminal. And we have two clerks that have resigned, so we have two positions available. We have advertised for those. And um, I think those, we just did interviews for one position just this last week, and so we'll be selecting this week, and the other one's still open till the 17th of this month. And then we have a court, our court administrator position is vacated, and that's going to be advertised after we have completed filling the, uh, the court clerk positions. And then we had ABI, um, Hankoop. Hankoop is the one assisting us with our video conferencing. ABI was the one that was awarded the contract to do our video conferencing. So that's why Hankoop was here presenting on that. And um, we also have a new legal counselor advisor, Bill Eggers. So um, uh, that's pretty much just real short brief because I know there's others that are going to give reports. Um, at this time, uh, Mr. Speaker, can I have the uh, permission to introduce our supporting staff? You have the floor to introduce whomever uh, you need to have to do the presentations from this time on. Okay. Um, Darren McDonald, he's going to uh, explain his title and his duties. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Secretary, members of the body, uh, my name is Darren McDonald. Uh, Charger strong during the relay season, if you don't know me. Um, I handle a lot of the security issues as a bailiff at the courts, maintenance inside and outside the facility, janitorial. I do some of the process work for us. Um, stand in where the clerks when they're needed. So that's basically what I do on any given day. Thank you. Like he said, he uses a lot of hats. There's quite a few staff that have just not one title, but many titles. Um, like we have Dean Bird um, in the front. He's an office manager, public relations. He does it all too. There's quite a few clerks that just don't do clerk work. They do a lot of other duties. And um, with that, um, can I have the permission to introduce the next report? Uh, Associate Judge Carey covers up.
Good morning. My name is Carrie Coverzuck. I'm associate judge for ju the judicial branch. Um, as you know and heard, we're trying to make changes within the judicial branch. And my responsibilities are the criminal court. <laughs> and we've been there for 43 days and we've made a lot of changes. And within the um, criminal court, we process all criminal offenses and procedures, and that includes arraignments, jury trials, bench trials, and sentencing. We've um, developed a new schedule in regards to the criminal court. The schedule is as follows. Monday through Friday, we have jury trials in the morning, and Friday we have pre-trials in the morning. We have adult arraignments Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 11, and we have bench trials Monday and Wednesdays at 2 p.m. And within um, the, judi the judicial branch and the criminal court, as of 2013, we had 3,090 cases that were arraigned within the court system. And as of this year, 2014, we've had 97. And we've had 335 warrants. Currently, we have 218 open cases. And there's, there's a lot of other statistics that um, my clerk can share with you as well. But um, so far, We've been um, assigned different, um, or we've been assigned clerks to assist us with our courtrooms, and that's been very helpful. And we are trying to um, maintain consistency within the um, within our judicial branch so that we can better serve the people. And this is my clerk, and I'll have her introduce herself. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Secretary, members of the body. My name is Rosanna Denny. I'm the criminal court clerk, <laughs> along with Sydney Eastman as the other court clerk. Uh, my jobs and duties are, if Sydney is not in, uh, we do arraignments. It starts with arraignments for the court. If they go to court and they plead guilty or not guilty, um, they have trials and it goes to me and I do the trials. Whether it's a bench trial or a jury trial, my job is to um, try to get jurors to come in to have a jury trial. Um, within the last six years, there hasn't been any jury trials because no one comes in for jury duty. and. We changed it up this year with the um, prosecutor and I and also the chief judge and we thought of a way that we can get the jurors to come in and so we did orders and we had them served personally to each juror and since then we've had eight jury, jury trials and out of those eight jury trials six of them were found guilty and two of them were not guilty. And like Judge Covers Up said, we've had 3,000 cases <clears throat> in 2013. We're almost at 100 cases just in, within 10 days of the new year. We have 335 open warrants. We have 218 cases, and that's what I do. Just in Crow Fair of this year, from August 14th to the 20th, we've had 251 inmates. So that's who came to jail. Just since Judge Covers Up took over in December 2nd, she's had 49 disorderly conducts, 13 DUIs, 31 possession of intoxicants, 10 obstructing peace officers, 5 arresting, resisting arrests, 11 endangering the welfare of children, 14 PFMAs, and 4 elderly abuses. Um, that's all we have for now. 
And with that, um, in closing, I would like to share um, what took place on Friday with um, setting a standard and trying to hold people accountable to do their um, jobs. I did notify prosecution of the change in the arraignment schedule and he was he had a deadline set for 10 a.m. for complaints to come into the office to be processed and then we move into arraignments but he did not meet that deadline so with that I went ahead and dismissed all cases because I didn't have proper complaints processed through our clerks and some people were mad of course the inmates were happy but I had to set a standard and I believe I did the right thing in sending a standard and that's all we have for criminal court and the next presentation will be um, the probation officers they work in collaboration with our criminal court so they will um, present their report as well Orrin Alden Howard Shane Thank you, Associate Judge. Uh, covers up. Will recognize the probation officers, Mr. Alden and Mr. Uh, Shane. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, members. My name is uh, Warren Alden. I'm the Chief Probation Officer for the the Tribal Court. Um, my colleague Howard Chain and I handle all adult probation and as my duties I handle everything uh, what we call long term everything over 90 days and Howard handles everything up to 90 days on the <clears throat> and um, the cases I handle are more more serious uh, felony felony uh, citation for just to give an example as our caseload uh, for the quarter of the fourth quarter of 2012 or 2013 excuse me I had uh, 53 cases that were assigned to my office uh, Mr. Shane will explain his or give his information here. Uh, with that, 58.3, I had um, active cases of 58, where I had a total of 111 cases currently. <clears throat> and with the breakdown there, um, for the fourth quarter, I had categorized assaults, including aggravated, uh, Assault, assault on police officer, vehicular assault. I had a number of six active cases, eight total, fourteen. And um, elder abuse. I have a total of six cases. Partner family member assault. For the fourth quarter, I had twenty-three new cases and 20 active with a total of 43. I have 16 DUI cases that I'm handling and with those 16 cases they include endangering the welfare of children so we have our young people driving around with their kids and with uh, possession of dangerous drugs I have uh, 11 new cases 9 active so I have a total of 20 and now I am including in my reports uh, imitation drugs. I have uh, just for the fourth quarter, I have five, five cases. Um, hours. This thing here is uh, the new the new drug for the young people is called Spice. Uh, that's a <clears throat> synthetic drug that's man-made and it's to have the same effects as marijuana. Uh, the active ingredient in marijuana is THC and it's to give that same effect. And the higher number of THC, the more significant the, the effects. And with 
imitation drugs as far as spice. Um, that's very traumatic to the brain. Um, reason I included it here for you today is um, I've had five cases and one of them, one case, um, a young lady is uh, up in Billings in the de Deaconess Ward. Uh, we don't know how long she's going to be there. She is on probation, but um, some people never recover from this. And um, I am in including this in my reports. Uh, there's still pending cases that have to go through the court system and be adjudicated. Um, another one I'm including is uh, unauthorized use of motor vehicles, uh, which included assault with a motor vehicle, and uh, I have three active cases from from the fourth quarter. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Shane and I, we are not involved in any any proceedings any proceedings until uh, individuals are adjudicated where we have a court order in hand and we go through the process of uh, what we call intake and that's where we get personal information, family, family information, family. Um, and <clears throat> with that, uh, like I said, I handle long term, which is Anyone uh, sentenced to over over uh, three months with probation that includes uh, a number of charges, whatever they may be. Um, and one thing that was mentioned was recidivism, and Howard and I have pretty much a hundred percent recidivism, uh, and ninety-eight percent. Of the cases we handle are alcohol related. Uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, turn the mic to Howard Cheney, probation officer. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Secretary, Senators, Beat Sagana Amigado sixty eight good thirty nine male, twenty nine female. Data I have total check ins of four hundred and fifteen for this quarter. And I, uh trap court spall important go to black charge. I get a foot change now, your executive legislature, middle judicial. Bond, 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 the way you are, Bapo Sago, Ba Seventy stars, welcome to your Dave Stewart administration. Come you are, sir. Come on, Mario, we are eight years, glad to be here, as Mario was, sir. Chairman Mao, be 18, good to be happy. Come on, Mario, we are eight years, good to be Carl Van, the Pim Odia, a new guard, I say. Continue to go, Mario. Yeah, I important good on travel courts for the May twenty seventh, nineteen eighty two. New Year's Sage, East Oxygen, Dick Lodge Grass School, Gon Ibo, Ikho. I'll go on Bawalajal travel courts for Kusalu. Hola. Okay, what will go Judge Roundface? We are sick yet. Over 100,000. Good up, good. 
You know, mm -hmm. national insurance, large press school, district court couldn't file with the District of Montana. Jurisdiction mark or go any question could the case could they the uh, Supreme Court he April 16, 1985. Supreme Court he got to go to the Fagot, Hush, June 30th, June 3rd, 1985. Got to go to the decision, go to the Supreme Court. Tribal courts, Kasalo, Emil Balsu, U.S. attorneys, Oegoda, what do you do? You know, Balsu, Bachiga, State, Supreme Court, Kukalo, Kole, Judge Aw, or Attorney all Clarence Blue. Uh, Wisconsin Indian law. Koyo Majumi. If we look to get for the Bowsu. Lead attorney. Co try it. But I think of yeah, Dale Lavender, Quick Attorney Law, Mark Skiller, Italy, Wisconsin School of Law, Konakadu, what do you watch? Indian Law, you watch a move. It, uh, VIA, it crow. Well, exactly, it was, uh, it's a real plain book. Cool. Lease is all. He, uh, uh, what he challenged to that U.S. The the audio of this uh, Ninth Circuit Court, Gallo, February third, nineteen eighty-two, Seattle, Washington. Uh, uh, Mike Eakin. We're going to shit to Judge Goody, I'd shit to I'd song. You can see what I'll do. Supreme Court, Ninth Circuit, Duke to all so. Iggy, ah, shit, said I. He's actually got him. Duck to April, go quiz, go got a knock to. Minor go to got bus be stick you. I'm going to so guy to it. It don't come on with car. Well, I got to buy it. Again, attorneys go to go to go to my room. Go to uh, the car milk. He balance looks so luck. Then, uh, Roger Renville will go. Attorney go to his desk, sir. I alluded to my legislature, particularly to people. They get that do much either cook a chicken no my dear. The Mirko Duck who make Leroy's is all the other. The Smith could act by how I am. Koshiagi used to. The big type of boys deal the. My chigastu. Uh, Ink executive for good. My chig, bala, bachi, yakudu. Bow out the ogoidu. Ma, come she badud. Cookie by it. Uh, Happy New Year. And God bless each one in your families. Go on. Oh, Howard.
Na ha volt, hogy belga, a gyakja, és pusztán kavar, precízat, pedigust, mert is ilyen csupak kupu, vagy valami ilyesmi. Mr. Speaker, can I turn the mic over to you? Uh, Associate Judge Notifree. Go ahead. Floor recognizes Associate Judge Notifree. Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Secretary, and members of the body, um, my name is Sheila, not afraid, I'm the associate judge, and um, as previously stated by the um, chief judge, I am the, um, the judge for the civil division of the Crow Tribal Court. I am in my second term as associate judge, and um, I've been assigned to, or Soraya has been assigned to the civil department, and this is Soraya Old Crow. She's um, she's the uh, she serves as the civil court clerk. Uh, we have we each have two clerks, but we have two vacancies as well. Um, we're hoping that. Um, well, we, again, we just had the hiring or the interview process for one of the civil court clerks this past Friday. And we'll probably have a definite answer or a, a hire for um, that position by this coming Friday, hopefully. Um, the other position um, is held by Susie Little White, who was due to come back to work today. However, because of her... Um, She's on uh, family medical leave. Her son has cancer, so and he just got sent back to to Denver last week. Um, so she's her and her families are always her, her and her family are always in our prayers, and we hope that um, he recovers soon. Um, part of the um, uh, improvements that well. I um, included some documents in the handouts that I sent out because we're doing some um, some changes changes to the department and um, it's to improve the efficiency of the court and basically all it is is going back to what the code tells us to do. Um, it's been for years I think the um, court has um, picked up a lot of courtesy to provide to the public, but in picking up all of the courtesy that they want to um, provide to the public, it's um, impacted the efficiency of the court. So um, one of the uh, main things that I wanted to, um, to point out is the um, service of process, how documents are, um, how um, pleadings and Complaints, petitions, everything is provided. Um, what I handed out comes directly from the um, amendment to the civil procedure, and that was amended through CLB 0505. Um, if you'll look at 54404, the last sentence states that all proof of service documents are, or no, it's um, 54403. Tribal court and clerk shall not be responsible for service of process. Um, that puts the burden on the parties to um, serve their own paperwork as far as their original pleadings and the motions they um, file with the court um, to move their cases along. And that there's one major thing that we're going back to. Um, it's not something that I'm making up personally. It's what the law says. And that's just something that um, the court is going to follow through with. And I bring that to your attention because it's a dramatic change. It's going to be a dramatic change for the public. And you'll probably be hearing from it. I hope not, but you'll probably be hearing from constituency about that. But 
That's what the law says and that's what the law tells me. Um, <clears throat> another um, um, another thing that we're doing is um, child support checks. The court receives child support checks and um, normally the um, court has um, how would you say that? Uh, accepted the checks for the um, recipients and um, held on to it and had them come in and pick it up and all of this stuff when in actuality we're, um, we only keep a record of it. Uh, at, we, we just mail it out to them or to whoever, to whoever the um, court order tells us, tells the clerk to mail it out to. The reason why this is important is because um, it interferes with day-to-day -day duties with the clerks. Um, by having public come in and um, ask about their checks, when do they get their checks, and all, all this other stuff. and um, It just helps with the efficiency. Not only that, but the, um, the Title 10 tells us exactly what we're supposed to do, and that's just to keep record of it and send it back out. So that's another thing you'll probably be hearing from the public about. And that was also a courtesy picked up by the court a long time ago, and it just basically snowballed. Um, another um, issue that the civil court, is, court has is um, performing DNA testing for paternity suits. The clerk is no longer going to be performing those tests. Those tests should be um, done by an independent um, third party. It keeps um, the court out of the loop as far as um, any, like, should anybody um, bring up the argument. The court should not be part of that that um, dispute. So that's another thing that the court's going to be doing. And that's another courtesy that was picked up a long time ago. And it just snowballed and fell on the shoulders of the clerks. and. Um, all of these changes are to improve the efficiency of the civil court. Um, and I believe by following through, it's exactly what we're told as um, amended and stated by the legislature. Um, and I believe that's um, probably what, what went through the minds of the, the body at the time was to improve the efficiency. And that's why it was written that way. So that's what we're going to do is follow through with what's written and what the law tells us to do. Um, at this time, I don't have the, um, the statistics as far as um, the petitions filed and um, complaints filed within this last quarter. Uh, as I previously stated, the, um, we've been without a clerk for quite a while. And we've been, um, Soraya's really new to all of this, and she's been doing a good job and picking up. And, but um, that's something that we can provide to the um, branch at a later time, if you feel you want to see those statistics. Um, on average, though, for um, throughout the year, uh, the civil court handles at least 400 cases that are filed. And um, those are the cases that my court hears. Um, additionally, to the duties I have as civil court clerk, I also assist um, the associate judge if she needs to um, have me handle arraignments for some reason, you know, whatever the reason may be. Same thing with um, the chief judge if he needs me to handle any of the um, juvenile proceedings. Um, I fill in for them. Um, and I'm really familiar with both departments, and it was a huge relief for me when we went into separate departments so we can concentrate on each department of a court and concentrate on improving the efficiency of each department of a court. Um, that way I can give all my attention to all the civil matters, and they're all very important matters. And same thing with the, the other the associate judge as well as the chief judge, they can concentrate on their court 
and concentrate on the issues arising in their court, and they've done an excellent job so far. And um, I'm really looking forward to the new system that we've come up with, and um, I believe that's all I have. Thank you, uh, Associate Judge Not Afraid. Chief Judge Not Afraid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members of the body, uh, I believe the Speaker has deferred to be the ability to call up uh, the juvenile uh, court staff, um, Lucille, uh, Nancy, Dominic, excuse me, Madam Court Clerk, Officer Oldell, and Healing to Wellness Coordinator, uh, Nancy Oldell as well. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, there are a number of things that we're moving forward on with reference to handling juvenile matters. Now I know that for, uh, the ones that I've served with, with in the past, uh, from my 2003 to 2000 term, with reference to children in need of care. Uh, Senator Goes Ahead remembers the fight that went to Washington, D.C., all the way to the office of Carl Artman, who was the assistant secretary at the time. And those of you also that were there, I, Speaker, you were there as well when child in need of care um, was vetoed and this branch overrode the veto and eventually we got a signature and that particular piece of legislation was near and dear to the Crow people. Everything from children, um, the jurisdictional question of the court where uh, there were children in, in Sheridan uh, where the executive branch at the time opted, the legal counsel opted to not have interest in those matters. And some of those children were not kept with Crow families. And I believe when the team, and I call this a team, Mr. Speaker, members of the body, when, when our team was brought together by the voters, uh, Judge Covers of uh, Judge Not Afraid, uh, one of the things that we looked at was how can the Chief Judge maximize his potential? And I believe uh, overseeing the juvenile court with reference to uh, delinquency and uh, youth in need of care and adoptions and guardianships. I believe it, it gives me the opportunity as the chief judge and the administrator of the judicial branch to be able to talk government to government with the BIA uh, social workers, the BIA um, superintendent, as well as the area in collaboration with the executive branch, uh, legal department, as well as the chairman's office. Um, referencing back to child in need of care. Uh, when we pass the law here, we only see bits and pieces, in my opinion, Mr. Speaker, of the law being in implemented at the judicial branch. Today, the day has arrived, Mr. Speaker. The day has arrived where currently we have the opportunity um, because of the collaboration and the help of of Judge Covers, up, who's, who's, who was a former uh, BIA Social Services Director, and also uh, the experience that uh, Judge Not Afraid presents to the court. Now, in the not too distant future, the County Attorney's Office through Bighorn County is setting up a meeting with the District Court Judge, the Honorable Judge Blair Jones and myself as the chief judge, as well as our staff in the juvenile division, to meet with Judge Jones and 
set up a court-to-court -court system where we will remove, in my opinion, the middlemen. Where I believe it's a great step into sovereignty in upholding our jurisdiction over our children. This event hasn't happened in well over 10 years. And even then, it's been bits and pieces. I believe it's an opportunity for the judicial branch to be involved in Crow children. In the matters of delinquency, uh, we handle um, uh, Bagada as they are arrested for various um, offenses. Now, we need to keep in mind, Senators, that the Judicial Division is a civil division. Um, Legal Counsel Jay Harris, I'm sure, could uh, confirm this as well as our Madam Court Clerk. Uh, the juvenile court is predominantly non-adversarial. Helene Bogadish, in the words of Senator Goes Ahead, justice to me means pointing someone in the right direction. And I believe you'll be hearing all about that when the Healing to Wellness Coordinator and the Healing to Wellness Court uh, speaks more about what we do. Um, before I was sworn into office on December 3rd, um, the juvenile case presenters. Now, I'm not trying to be here, Mr. Speaker, and, and, and go against being positive. Uh, this is just part of my report. I, 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 I can talk all day about problems, but I, I just want to tell the branch here, the body up front, what had gone on previously, previously to me stepping on board. Um, when the youth are detained in Busby, <coughs> the juvenile case presenter who works for the executive branch has a duty. And that duty is that they are required to coordinate with the juvenile officer, Mr. Officer Dominic Oldout, to get those youth in front of a judge within 48 hours. And when those youth are brought in front of a judge within 48 hours, the parents are to be contacted. And there are specific timelines. And within 10 days, you have, if the youth is being detained, you have to have an initial hearing where the young person has the opportunity to admit or deny the allegation. And within that time, the juvenile case presenter's duty is to file a petition. Now, when I first stepped on board, I was under the, the watchful eye of Madam Court Clerk Lucille Yarlett. I, I mean, she's, in my opinion, I mean, let's get culture and tradition out of the way. Vivian Tiwik Dela, she's my big sister because of who adopted me, but she's the watchdog of all watchdogs. As soon as I stepped on board, Madam Court Clerk informed me that there's been cases sitting within the juvenile division for since like July where no formal petition has been filed. Mr. Harris, I'm sure you find that disturbing. No petition, no jurisdiction. So when I opened the files because of the advisory of Madam Court Clerk, I immediately dismissed matters without prejudice until the juvenile case presenter brings me a formal petition. That, I believe, Mr. Speaker, is in the interest of justice. And there were, I mean, I'm not trying to be negative here. It's just the facts that we have to do it right. We have to make sure that the human rights and the rights guaranteed by our Constitution and these young people are treated fairly. And I believe that is our mission. That is our duty. Uh, and and, and we're, we're making quick moves to make sure that the file is done right. Where we, the juvenile officer may have discretion, which he does in the code, to go into an informal adjustment agreement with families to get this child into school, to get a young person uh, on a good road. Maybe he, needs a, uh, he or she needs an evaluation 
uh, with, if they have a drug and alcohol problem. But anyway, I, I just uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm fired up because it's important to me that the court does it right. That the code is upheld. That each step is followed because the body passed the law. And the body, when you pass the law, the chairman signed it into law. And when that took place, it's my duty to uphold the law. And that's why we're here today. De la, na, getting back to ch children in need of care. He like, yeah, uh, there was a recent situation. Now, I can't discuss cases, um, uh, or any of us for that matter, can, can discuss cases in public or name names. Because of confidential matters, we're, 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 we're bound by ethics and law. But I'll give you, for an, for an instance, I'll give you for uh, an example. Uh, recently, uh, there's a Bawawa Chesu, Bagaram, is uh, being put up for adoption through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And in accordance with child in need of care, Dr. J. Um, Senator goes ahead that the family, Crow tribal members, grandmother, aunts, uncles, brothers, have standing. Uh, in my recent hearing, when the Bureau of Indian Affairs came into court, the, 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 the uh, Parents who were not members of our tribe, the foster parents who were not members of our tribe, were getting ready to adopt on the same day. The Wajwewu senators, I will not allow that to happen without proper notice to the families. My goal is to keep Crow children with the Crow people where possible. If I find out otherwise, I, I, I won't stand for it. You have my word. Where possible. Now there's instances off the reservation where we can't provide the specialized service, uh, services yet here. Where we need to keep them in a specific service setting off the reservation. But mind you, in the future when we have this judge to judge meeting with Judge Jones in, in Bighorn County. The court from here on out will do its very best in accordance to the law to be involved. We will maintain that jurisdiction over our children. No more. In my opinion. And they will, uh, to the best of my ability, they will stay here where possible. There may be a rare occurrence, a rare occurrence where Apsala again, family get in, may go, ah, Alagolush itchik. And until I hear that, my first duty is to keep them home. Aloha. Deila, Hilage, Alagulu, Hina. Where the court is really non-adversarial is guardianship, some adoptions, most adoptions, and name changes. And Ajeda, the most of the time the parties, the mother and the father, uh, working together with, let's say, grandparents, um, in unison agree to consent for guardianship. Those, in those situations, the court can provide a summary order where maybe there's parents that need to get back on their feet and uh, the grand the grandparents are stepping up to the plate. Ikarish cook their non adversarial and Ikarish Kowagukilaga. And um, to make a long story longer, Mr. Speaker, um, cases filed for two thousand and thirteen civil cases, one hundred and eleven. Juvenile offenses committed, 309. <coughs> Current case open in just where either civil or, civil or criminal offenders, 117 cases and eight offenders with warrants of detention. Um, Madam Court Clerk, did I forget anything? 
I got she's ball oh, just you she's my pit bull in the courtroom and in chambers if it's not done right um, I hear about it like uh, Lucille's been in Madam Court Clerk's been in working for the judicial branch for 30 years and when it's not done right I hear about it now right right now and, and we, we make sure that it's done right and at this time um, I'd like to turn the floor over to juvenile officer uh, Dominic Old Elk Mr. Speaker, Mr. Secretary, and uh, members of the body, uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, most of you probably know me, I'm Dominic Odell. Um, my dad was in a, Dan Odell was a legislature for a number of years, so I understand um, some of your guys' duties also. Uh, first of all, I'm going to go over uh, the mission of the Crow Tribal Juvenile probation office and it's to, to prov provide access to early intervention, supervision, uh, treatment, and secure care for youth and families so that youth learn accountability and responsibility and community safety is enhanced. Um, the vision is, uh, is a place where justice means promoting public safety while improving and enriching the lives of offenders, victims, families, and the community. And um, we, didn't have, we haven't had a juvenile probation officer for a number of years. Um, I don't even remember. I think uh, Kenny Shane was a juvenile truancy officer uh, and worked some of the probation and then I just started in March of this past year. So I have only been here for 10 months. Uh, my legal duties are to supervise, uh, keep records, investigate, receive offenders, uh, enforce the orders of the court, and protect the public by providing appropriate supervision of offenders. Uh, some of the duties that I have uh, learned and accomplished, um, I've learned and utilized uh, the Title IX of the Crow Law and Order Code as it pertains to juveniles, and I'm still learning that code every week. I mean, I read it almost every day, and somebody's always telling me something different, especially the legal department, or yeah, the, the attorneys, the legal department, they're always telling me something different and trying to twist my role. <laughs> and so, and, and I and learn a lot from, um, Madam Clerk here, Lucille also. Um, uh, like I said, I, I, I also uh, learned the juvenile court procedures uh, as far as roles for the judges, uh, the presenter, which is the attorney, the clerks, and other staff of the court system. Um, I researched uh, the organization of the juvenile probation office, and I also was um, Glad to have gone to Seattle, and I went to the Tribal Probation Academy to learn more of my role, and I got the, my certificate for that, for TPA, in this past uh, December. Thank you. And uh, so that helps me to learn quite of what I need to know. Um, I, take, I do juvenile intakes regarding the dynamics of the youth's overall social and delinquent situation. I investigate both juvenile and truancy cases. Um, I make recommendations uh, to the court on juvenile cases, presenting, and I present testimony in court also. Um, all these cases that I deal with are um, youth in need of supervision. Uh, every once in a while, I'll have a, a youth that is both youth in need of supervision and youth in need of care. And those are the hardest to work with because sometimes they don't, you have a hard, we have a hard time finding places for them to go sometimes. Um, I collaborate with the other juvenile probation officers, uh, especially with the Northern Cheyenne. Uh, we have what what's called the courtesy supervision. Uh, they, some of their kids got in trouble at Crow Fair over here, so they help to supervise them when they go back over to Lame Deer and Busby, and so they helped me in that sense. And then I extended that offer to them also that 
if any of our Crow kids get in trouble over there and they come back home, then we are willing to supervise them also. Um, I also make referrals to the Crow Nation Lawn Center for CD evaluations and follow up on that for those kids that have trouble with alcohol and drugs. Um, also make referrals to the Crow Nation well uh, to the um, Crow Nation Wellness, uh, not the Crow Nation Wellness. I always get those two mixed up. The Healing to Wellness Drug Court, it's the Healing to Wellness um, Juvenile Drug Court, which uh, my wife is the director of for a number of years. Uh, they do. Uh, it's a deferment program where. Once they go through the program, then all their charges are dropped and dismissed. And that's the same thing with uh, informal adjustment agreements. I will make an agreement with the family, with the kid. Um, the juvenile presenter is notified, and she signs the papers also, and then it's uh, sent to the judge, and then they finalize it. And informal adjustments uh, cannot extend a year. Um, I usually my practice has been for each charge it's been two months and also depending on you know each each case and so although they might be done with the time if they have not completed everything like a CD evaluation um, the their their agreement is not done so they have to complete everything for their case to be dismissed uh, like I said, I collaborate with uh, attorneys, also collaborate with uh, the school officials, uh, school counselors, and uh, we have 17 different schools in the reservation and around the reservation. That includes uh, primary, elementary, and middle school. So each one of these schools has a principal. So we have 17 different schools, that's like La Brea, you know, even the little tiny school Marin, over by Pryor, we go over there. So I, I visited all these schools uh, as far as truancy is concerned. Um, chaperone youth and transport youth uh, from Busby, um, also with the uh, wellness court program. Uh, take statistical data and report for grant purposes. Compose and conduct informal adjustment agreements. Uh, I also did uh, bailiff duties, so I learned how to do that at one point and even learn how to uh, mail a certificate of service. So even small things I'm learning. Um, went to the uh, applied suicide intervention training. So I, we help out on crisis calls. Uh, so like if the high school, they lose a student. I go with the counselors and help them and talk with the kids. Even then when we lost a, a teacher here at Little Big One College, I was avail available for that. And, went and talked to students and teachers over there. And so I help, um, I try to help to counsel and in that sense, because that's what my original um, degree was in counseling and healing uh, in uh, human services. And that's what I was trying to strive for when I come upon this job. And, you know, I figured I can do this, so I'm, I'm doing this. <laughs> um, I also uh, um, try to be accountable for all my actions. I, uh, like the judge said, uh, we have uh, confidentiality and ethics, so I can't speak about certain cases or I can't speak kids' names. And so we, we do that with counselors and whoever else we're allowed to talk to or not talk to. And so we try to make sure who we speak to about a certain kid. And uh, try to be professional at all times with the public and with my peers. Um, and at the end of the day, we have to learn how to de-escalate because we hear so much stuff and we see so much stuff, and a lot of it's negative. So, you know, maybe a couple times a week, try to get in a sweat, you know, and try to have, we try to keep our work separate from our home life because it is very stressful work. Uh, here's some uh, minor statistics uh, since March, uh, since I started, since I started work, I've had 93 juveniles that have gone to uh, Crow Quarter, charges ranging from uh, MIP, criminal mischief, disorderly conduct, DUI, 
unlawful use of motor vehicle, theft, reckless driving, assault, uh, elderly abuse, uh, possession of dangerous drugs, possession of drug paraphernalia, arson, resisting arrest, and trespassing. Uh, I have 20 cases that have been referred to the Healing Duanas Drug Court, or they were already in that program. I've had 30 cases that have signed into an informal adjustment agreement, and 20 have completed, and their charges have been dismissed. Uh, I have two cases that were dismissed because of technicalities, and I have eight current cases right now, and I think I'm about to refer a couple more. Uh, we have we have we had 16 warrants um, established on the youth uh, for not coming back to court or for having new charges drawn up on them. <coughs> Three of the warrants have been quashed or they showed up. Uh, four of the youth that became adults, therefore there there are only like nine currents uh, currently pending. Uh, we have 19 cases are currently pending. I'm sure there's more than that that I know of uh, and then we have 19 cases cases that have been closed or dismissed and throughout this whole time that I've worked we have not had one single adjudication and I think that uh, I believe that's I hope that's going to change because we need some things to be different uh, goals and plans and ongoing responsibilities um, we're working with a group of um, tribal and BIA uh, personnel to improve uh, truancy issues by effectively enforcing the Crow Truancy Act and planning to implement necessary criteria and being able to carry those laws out. Uh, establishing a working uh, memorandum of agreement with the superintendents of each school concerning the legal aspects of uh, truancy and Crow court system. And once in a while, I do research when I can. I research uh, evidence-based practices and intervention, which is uh, practices that work well in improving the outcomes in the lives of juveniles, and restorative justice, which is uh, direct involvement by offender and victim or community. So an apology to the victim is important. We don't have that. Uh, upon completion of research, uh, implement and utilize those techniques that are realistic and that can be achieved to reduce juvenile delinquency. Uh, like I said, I'm continuously learning and interpreting the juvenile code and continue to improve the record keeping, the reporting and statistics in an effort to show accountability for administrative purposes and accessibility for efficient working conditions. And you know, with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, officer. Um, with that, uh, this next, last but not least, segment of the court in its entirety, um, Healing to Wellness Court, Diwajru, Bilaga, I am fired up, Mr. Speaker, about the potential of Healing to Wellness Court. I've, I, before I got sworn in on December 3rd, and before I, be, because the, above all, God and, and, and His will and the Crow people's will, Biwa uh, Chilin, to be real honest, I had no clue. I, I've heard about Healing to Wellness Court. I, I even seen uh, um, Nancy Oldow present in Reno about it, uh, Healing to Wellness Court. But until I sat in the room with the family that's involved, as well as the young person, man, it, it, it's, I've sat in two, three sessions now, two with young people who are in the program, and, and Nancy will tell all about it, I tell you what, that we have a healing to wellness court that grants the young person the opportunity. Now, when I sit in the meeting, it's not a formal court, adversarial court session. It's the family sitting at the table and all the players that are involved, everyone from Crow, Crow Nation Wellness, 
a juvenile officer. I believe oftentimes Dr. Sutherland from mental health is involved. And I'll give you two examples and then I'll turn the mic over to Nancy. Um, there, there was one instance for, where a young man um, was is it's currently having a tough time in school. And I, I sat there, I was like listening, and the, the grandmother was there. And, and at, at the end of this, at the end of our meeting, I, I told the young man, I says, Igyo Omni Wajuigma. Hila gya. Hina mama chimish. Greats de chusis. Good dollar. I'll personally take you out for pizza. That is the goal of healing the wellness. And then there was another case. There's a, there's a young man uh, in the not too distant future that's going into um, a, 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 a program where this individual is trying to improve himself. Um, statewide program. Oh, what's the name of the program again? Montana Youth Challenge. Montana Youth Challenge. And, and uh, this individual has had a hard time staying sober. He, he leaves in about a week. Because I'm a recovering alcoholic drug addict. Senator goes ahead, Speaker Oak Crow, they know, they know my story. I, I sobered up here at the legislative branch eight years ago when this branch held me accountable. And I could sit there and relate with this young man. I says, you got a week and a half to go. To head out to this program. You've expressed that. You've got it. You're having a hard time staying sober. I says, you contact Nancy. This is what I told the young man. You contact Nancy. Tough time staying sober. I can get you to a sweat lodge. Uh, if you need to get to church, I can get, to, I can get you to church. If you need to get to a 12-step meeting... Uh, for alcoholics or drug addicts, I, I, I can get you to the meeting. Or if you just want to have a coat, I'll be there, man. And, and I, the uniqueness of healing the wellness. Turn the floor over uh, to Nancy. Thank you, Your Honor. Speaker, Senators. Secretary, I apologize, and members of the body. I'm not real good at holding microphones, so if I, I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, many of you, some of you I know, many of you probably do not know me. My name is Nancy Old Elk. I am an enrolled member of the Cherokee Nation. My husband is Dominic Old Elk, and my adopted parents are Manuel and Linda Coversup. Um, it's an honor for me to be here, and um, to, it's always an honor for me to be able to talk about the Juvenile Healing to Wellness Court. Um, I started for the Crow Tribal Court in August of 2005, and in September of 2006, I was asked by Melissa Holds the Enemy if I was interested, and she was going off to law school, and she recommended me for the position of uh, the Juvenile Healing to Wellness Coordinator. Um, I too am in, a reco in recovery, and so this was right up my line, what I do in my life as well. So I gladly accepted, and through, of course, applying and resume and everything else, I went from um, administrative assistant into juvenile healing to wellness court director. The Healing to Wellness Court was started in 2002 by a juvenile drug court grant. That grant ended in December of 2006. And the Crow Tribe is one of the few tribes in the nation that has a self-sustaining drug court. Um, I'm often asked to go to different areas and present. And please know that I always brag about your wisdom in knowing how to sustain a drug court. I believe even at that presentation, um, I asked the audience how many of them had a drug court. And 75% of their hands went up and they no longer have a drug court. So they got the grant, they got it started, and then it went away. 
Um, you have had it, uh, drug court since 2002 and self-sustained since 06. So. Um, let's see. Healing to Wellness Court. I'm a little nervous, so I apologize. <laughs> Healing to Wellness Court. It differs in many ways than regular court. And, um, the Honorable Judge explained some of those things. One is that he has the liberty to sit with us at the table and discuss cases, circumstances, situations with the families and the youth. And we work as a team. It's not one person saying these things or doing these things. It is the judge's ultimate decision. But we work as a team. So we do work with Behavioral Health and Coronation Wellness Center and the Adolescent Officer and... Um, it is my responsibility, though, however, to monitor the grades and attendance. Um, I do drug testing, um, curfew, curfew calls. Um, even, I, it doesn't stop. It's 24-7, and that's my dedication. I mean, Crow Fair, we don't get off for Crow Fair. I have kids, my husband knows this at our camp, all the time, because I'd much rather them come over and sit down and have some dinner and be out drinking. So if they want to come by and have a safe place to stop, they're always welcome. And with that being said, even as far as horses, some of our youth don't have that liberty. And my husband and I have been blessed to have a few. And so if there's a youth that wants to parade or something, we try to always have an available horse for them. I'm getting a little off track, but Healing to Wellness is a kind of a wider umbrella. And we do so many var various things. And part of the self-sustaining is because we have to collaborate. I collaborate, 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 um, stick my hand out. This is, a, this is what we're doing. This is what we're trying to achieve. And so I work a lot with the tribal um, youth programs and Coronation Wellness Center or whatever activity. Sometimes it's Montana Youth Challenge. And we just try to really work together to see how we can make opportunities for the youth. It doesn't mean that my suggestion or the team's suggestion is the right one, but we discuss it as a team with the family and the judge. And together, we try to formulate a plan that helps the youth make better choices. Um, let's see. There's four phases of the youth court. Um, the beginning phase is very structured. They have curfew calls. They have to improve. If they're not in school, they have to go back to school or be enrolled in a GED program. They have to be doing something for their education part of it. As, and that's part of the law and order code as well. So it's very structured in the beginning. But we work on, uh, we're non-adversarial, so we work on sanctions and incentives. So when they're doing well, maybe they got clean UAs and, um, they're back in school and their attendance is approving. So we might lift something. Maybe it's, um, you don't have to call Nancy 15 times a day anymore, just once, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And it is case by case, we can individualize it. It's not one size shoe fits all. We can individualize it per youth and per circumstance. Um, so that's one of the unique things. But we are structured and... Um, Typically, the, the program can be finished in six months. I've had the youth do it. Um, the problem usually arises is that the, when they get to Healing to Wellness Court, they don't get on board right away. So we will have a plan of action for them, and they have four to six weeks to get their CD evaluation, their behavioral health evaluation, enroll in school or GED, and then we'll do a review hearing with the judge and our team and we get to that review hearing and they haven't done it. So that's already almost two months time. And so by the time working with the families, working with them, get on track, it usually takes two to four months just for that part. And then they're on board and they're, okay, let's do this. So it's been my experience that it takes almost a year for them to finish, but that's not because of our requirement. It's because of their progress. It's 12 hours. Um, I've had youth... Because you're, we're self-sustaining now, I've had youth that, that have finished and asked to stay in the program. Absolutely, we have the option to do whatever we want. We're not grant-driven anymore. And our, our, our goal has always been to support in any way. So we have youth that still call when they're having children now. Yes, I've been there that long. And, um, 
and youth that have stayed in the program. One youth stayed in for two years, but it was his choice, not, not our choice. But he just wanted to graduate high school, and he needed the structure, so we kept him. But with all that being said, what happens is uh, maybe Dominic's made the referral to Healing to Wellness, and they uh, went through all four phases of the program. Then the records expunge. We have a formal graduation ceremony for them, and all the players, you know, the uh, Coronation Wellness Center, the Behavioral Health, um, any tribal youth program that we've been working with throughout that year or throughout that child's um, duration of Healing to Wellness, we invite them. And, and if you are, any of you are ever interested in attending one of those, um, I can be sure and let you know you're more than welcome. For that matter, if any of you would like to be a speaker, a guest speaker for us, or um, we do a lot of um, equine, assisted therapy, different activities, we would love to have you. Yes, and with that, I'm getting on to the, some of our activities. Um, we do, even in the summer, we do a lot of the camps and stuff like this, but I want you to know that our camps, I don't pick it. Dominic doesn't pick it, Lucille doesn't pick it, the chief judge, we don't choose. What I encourage, we encourage the youth to do is you can do anything that you want to do and we'll support you. What is it that you want to do? And this last summer they wanted to do a trail ride in the mountains on horseback and camp. So we did and we've got assistance from the executive branch, um, tribal youth program, um, Crow Nation Wellness Center, um, MSPI, we all jumped on board. And the difference though is we didn't meet and discuss what the kids were going to do. I made sure to make the meetings after, out, out, uh, at a time where the youth could be there so the youth were present for every meeting. They picked the time, they picked the day. We went up and I took them up and I got a permit and we went up and drove the mountains to find out where they wanted to ride from, where they wanted to go to. That was all their decision making. Because one of the things that we believe is um, knowledge is power. And they have the power. Just, they might need our assistance, but they can do these things. Um, we also do equine therapy um, throughout the summer. And I'm equine assisted therapy. Um, certified level one and two, which doesn't mean a whole lot, except for that horses and crow kids work really well. Um, you have a youth that doesn't trust anybody or doesn't want to talk to anybody, and you put them in with the horse, and every, the dynamics change totally. Um, if you're interested in any of that stuff, you're always welcome. We never have a closed door. You're welcome. The only thing I ask is you keep in mind that these kids are um, they have the rest of their life ahead of them, so we don't discuss any of their names or anything outside of here. Uh, I just absolutely am against that. They have their whole life ahead of them, and there's no, no need for discussion other than how we can better assist them. And the other thing that we get, we get calls a lot from other tribes, and it's for our, our equine therapy portion um, and our elders panel. We have an elders panel. I handed out a brochure, and some of this stuff is in there. Um, our elders panel is unique, and some of the other tribes are modeling the Crow tribe. Um, we have two male, two female, and they pray for our youth year-round. But at graduation time, they'll come and they have a chance to visit with the youth one-on-one. -on -one. And it's been a very, you know, our words are sacred. So one of the requirements for the youth is that they have to tell about their goals for the future to the elders panel, and then they get that one-on-one -on -one response from each member. I have also handed out, earlier I mentioned that I'm asked to go around and I'm um, often asked to present. Uh, I handed out per district, I, I apologize, I didn't have enough for everybody, but I did hand these out. These are the 10 key components for um, tribal wellness courts. You, I'm sure you've heard of um, the state drug court, and um, the tribes have found that their state drug court components aren't affected for the tribes. 
so tribal law and policy created these specifically for tribes. Um, so we try our best to go along these components um, because of staffing, because of budget. We might not all be there, but that is our goal. These are our goal, and we're pretty. Um, I was telling Judge Not Afraid that we're pretty close to being a model court for the nation, for other tribes. And I do get calls often, and I try my best to assist them because I want them all to have the success that the Crow Tribe has. I want them all to be able to be self-sustaining. Um, and I'm just really grateful. I have a presentation on Healing to Wellness um, about these 10 key components. I'm more than willing to come back. It's a PowerPoint, and it goes into better detail. I'm trying to skim over things, and I may have jumped around and lost you, but I've already, we've discussed that with the chief judge, and he's willing to allow me to come and do that. If that's something you're interested in, I can absolutely um, work with the chief judge and get that done for you. Um, my phone number is on the back of this um, brochure. If at any time you have any questions for me at all, or any suggestions, or if you're able to volunteer, please give me a call and we'll, we'll work it out. I thank you for letting me be here. Oh. Madam Court Clerk. Madam Did you have anything to add? Could you um could you add? Okay, my name is Lucille Yarlett. I'm a juvenile court clerk. And <clears throat> so like he said, I was watching to make sure all of them didn't miss anything. And expunge uh, deferred cases when they go to, um, if not, Dominic, Nancy. Uh, deferred cases are at the end, if they're successful and they've completed, their cases are expunged, meaning they're no longer in their files. That's not part of their background, but most of them are. The code requires that we destroy juvenile court cases when they reach the age of 21. So um, the federal court system sometimes wants to come back and dig in the background of a juvenile who maybe about 30, 40 years down the road, we cannot give it to them. You have passed a law that says you destroy their juvenile cases when they turn 18, like they were never there. That's ex those are the exact words in that code. Thank you. Um, oh, this past summer I had to go through the case files that were, have been sitting there and I did orders that quoted uh, uh, the code where they reached 21 years of age and had the judge sign and Darren I think started to um, burned them and it was a, I guess we need an incinerator. It didn't work and so our next step was to get them shredded, I think, shredded in Billings. But they were sitting there forever in my office. That's like, kind of looks something like that. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, Finally, when Judge Notafraid came, he had them taken away, so I don't know where they're at. All right, thank you. <laughs> I hope, I think, uh, let's give them a round of applause. So I think that's it for now. Thank you. Mr. Speaker and members of the body, um, the good news is 
juvenile cases are on a, a, a steep decline because of what Healing to Wellness is doing and uh, because uh, the youth are being held accountable. In my day, there was no Busby detention facility. And back in my day, we were never arrested. The parents would come home or come to the jail and pick us up. And that was it. And our cases would slip through the cracks. In fact, I think my file was in one of those files sitting in there, so it needs to be destroyed. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, young people are held at the detention facility for safety purposes. Sometimes they're uh, intoxicated or sometimes they, they, they've threatened to hurt themselves um, or somebody else's safety is threatened. And um, they receive medical clearance before they go to uh, Busby. But anyway, that is a last resort. Uh, my goal is not to put youth in jail. I think we can find alternatives working with parents to point them in the right direction. And um, I, I believe, Mr. Speaker, this would conclude the judicial branch's presentation. They've done an excellent job. In the six years and the two terms I was at here at the legislative branch, this has never happened. Where the branch came as a whole to, per, to provide to you, the legislative body, who we are and what we do. Um, I did mention to the speaker earlier, uh, Chairman of, of Revenue, uh, Duke goes ahead. Um, with your permission, I would like to do a very detailed, transparent financial report with the Revenue Committee at a later date as it meets your schedule. I would like to bring the CPA and Mr. Marlin passes as well as all of the players to the table to get you the financial records as required by the Constitution. To be honest, Mr. Chairman, I am still catching up 42 days in office 43 days in office, I'm still learning the numbers, uh, bringing expenditures together, learning about what we need to do to improve our work at the branch. One of the things we found out, and I'm not trying to put anybody down from the past, or we're, we're moving forward, but this is an example of things that I found out stepping on board. One of the things that we found out was there was supposed to be, a, through a DOJ grant, a peacemaker court in place by the judicial branch. That never occurred. We lost the money, period. That's the facts. I'm not making this up. Those are the kinds of things that I'm finding out stepping on board as the new chief judge. And the judges are always aware of what's going on, the associate judges, because we're a team. Uh, I think before the, the chief judge made all the decisions, which, yeah, it's, it's in the code, it's discretionary. But if I don't promote team in our branch, then I'm no good. I mean, without the team, I'm nothing. It's just like here at the legislative branch. We were nothing without, we're nothing without our staff. Our staff are our eyes and ears, and they are our defenders. They are our defenders when uh, difficult people come to the branch and they... they Point them in the right direction, and my and that's 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 what we're doing at the judicial branch. So, with due respect, uh, Senator, I think it will be an appropriate time to uh, open the books and look at the numbers and and, and so forth. Order. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I I'd like to offer a round of applause before we go into Q and A. With your permission, Speaker, for the judicial branch, round of applause. I did a Phenomenal job today. Judges covers up. Judges not afraid. Uh, I could not have a better team. It's it's phenomenal. But uh, Mr. Speaker, I turn the floor back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chief Judge. Uh, members of the body, uh, uh, judicial branch. Oh, it's it's guys too. I got Leroy Jalashesko. I had him for about eight years here. Shut the net. Good image. He's been here for ten years. Uh, Masa 
monologue. We, 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 I've got q and A. I'll open the floor, and I'll leave it at the judge's discretion to accept the uh, floor. Uh, floor recognizes Pat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Secretary, members of the body, and uh, judicial branch. Dave says, "Oh my goodness, thanks for coming over and giving us a, a good report." And like you said, ever since I've been here, it uh, hasn't uh, actually gotten to this. So, um, just a little reminder: we kind of restructured in our committees uh, under this uh, January session under six committees. So, then I believe uh, Senator Wilbert uh, falls under the chairman of the judicial committee. And just a little reminder before I get to my question here, um, and I gave uh, judges a hand on uh, Chief Judge also, uh, maybe I'll keep the hand up before you leave here. I, I did receive that in the mail. Okay, Thank thanks. Um, but let me get to my question here now. I know it was, uh, I believe, uh, Chief Judge um, Associate Janotipur that mentioned on this um, processing of service, our service of process, she mentioned that it was going to, uh, you guys are going to eventually change, correct? I mean, the process. I know that it's uh, it states under here. But let me just read a little bit of a um, either personally or by handling the defendant a copy of summons and complaint wherever the defendant may be found. I mean, I'm just trying to help out here. If, whether we have to amend this language or is it going to work or is it going to be a problem coming? So I've, I know you mentioned that, and whether it's beginning with the judicial committee and amending the language and. Because I see, a, I see a problem in the future with this. If, um, so that's one of the first question. Okay, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Judge Notafrey. Hello, oh, Richard. Uh, Associate Judge Notafrey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, Secretary, members of the body. I am glad you asked that question, and that's exactly why I brought it up. There's um, always room for amendment. And I can't, I personally can't tell you how to do that, what language should be placed in there. Um, I believe that you'll get the feedback from your constituency to see what works for them and um, introduce it as an amendment. Um, and that would be how, and then once, once it's amended and once it's in effect, I'll the court will go with it, whatever the um, legislature passes. Okay, so I'm just kind of arising that question. So maybe get with a judicial committee, and that's uh, they'll log it down, and that's some area that we have to look at because I know it looks like it's going to be a problem down in the future. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to get you guys caught up on questions here. Let me. Um, another question I had was uh, the spice issue. Our current law, maybe Jay. Our current law does that. Um, is that in the current law right now? You can call Jay. All right, we have to. Is that something that we need to amend also? Uh, what does it call it? I remember it's a synth synthetic under state, isn't it? Something synthetic. Right, Chief Judge. Is that what it is? Mr. Speaker, if I'm not mistaken, it's designated as designer. Mr. Harris, I don't know if you could. Floor is <laughs> up. Council. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, Secretary, members of the body, uh, pro-tribal judicial branch of government, your honors, uh, honor to be in your presence. Uh, the question, as I understand it, is whether or not <clears throat> the uh, synthetic manufactured drug that we commonly know as spice is uh, addressed in our law and order code. It arguably may be, uh, if someone had Title Eight B before them, our criminal code, you could take a look at it. its last few provisions that govern the uh, criminalization of the sale, use, or possession of dangerous drugs. <clears throat> I think it would be arguably a dangerous drug. I don't know offhand if that's a statutorily defined term, but we do have code language that prohibits use, possession, or sale of dangerous drugs. And as I recall, it's not specifically defined, although I could be wrong. Um, there is also a language that prohibits uh, possession of drug paraphernalia and it's, as I recall, it's very broad language and certainly something we could take a look at, like the Montana legislature did, which in its uh, most recent session, trying to stay ahead of the game, has uh, adopted and revised uh, drug use and possession laws so as to hit on these uh, 
designer drugs that are um, that every jurisdiction across the country is, is having to address because uh, of the issues that have come up, uh, very important health uh, issues that have arisen. So yeah, it's a kind of a long question that doesn't really, or excuse me, long answer doesn't really address the question, but I'd have to look specifically at the language in Title 8B. But we do have dangerous drugs specifically outlawed in the law currently. Chief Judge. Um, I'd like to ask um, Judge Covers up to come further uh, entertain the question. Hello, we're going to associate Judge Covers up. She's handling these matter matters directly, most definitely. I just wanted to note that it's considered imitation drug in the Law and Order Code, and we have to differentiate between that as well as dangerous drugs. So we label it as imitation. Does that answer your question? Yes and no. I mean, is it in the area where maybe, uh, like you said, we have to uh, amend through judicial and help help the whole branch out, whichever direction we need. Maybe there is a different language we need in there. So, um, just to, like I said, just kind of a highlight that question and uh, bring it up in a judicial meeting. And, if we can be any help if we can on that issue. Um, thank you, Pat. I guess um, I guess my question is in regards to him. Uh, I would ask it my way, I guess, is uh, is the current law covering the situation with spice? And I think that's what he asked. Jay, Jay said it was very broad. And if it's very broad, to me, I guess it would cover it if you can uh, define it in a cer certain way, I guess, as, as a judge. Uh, I'm not a judge, so I, I wouldn't know, but you know, just as a layperson, in regards to that, I would consider it a, a dangerous drug, but I guess you have to interpret it the way uh, you feel it is according to the law. Um, go ahead. Uh, well, in regards up. to um, differentiating it between the dangerous drug and the imitation, it does directly fall under into uh, the imi <coughs> imitation drug. Thank you. Um, I'm going to recognize CJ uh, Conrad Stewart. He had a question too. So, um, <clears throat> home of Speaker, Secretary, Chief Judge, Associate Judge covers up and not afraid. Um, yes, I just wanted to um, um, share my appreciation for this report. Um, I know you guys are, are are doing, you know, this is the first report that has come through, and it's only going to get better, the way I see it. Um, I know that you, you brought brought out and read a lot of statistics and stuff, and you guys are still 43 days in, still studying it, still figuring it out. Um, maybe in a later date, like we're, we're going to have a later date with, with the Revenue Finance Chair, and so... Maybe we can um, forward some of those statistics, these these areas, and suggestions. Like right now, we have we have a question on the floor that um, and the concern that maybe imitation or whatever, maybe it's just specific, or maybe you just you would just want to keep it in the keep it broad, just to say imitation. Um, we don't know because um, right now I know there's a lot of um, concern with um, spice. People can pick it up and share it, and people can pick it up, people have it, and just the horror stories that are surrounding that, that drug, where it, it can paralyze you, kids going to strokes, kids fall into a position where they, 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 they don't even know who they are, and then they, they commit um, serious crimes. And then there's um, the imitation meth that is being, um, prescribed to the different meth addicts that are, or or the ones that are in, you know, they, they I, I don't know, from what I've understood is there's a lot of people out there that, that claim they want to get off of it, but they find a legal loophole to get the, to get the, um, the drug, I guess, under the government to wean them off, but they use that, and then they, Rather than go out and search for whatever drugs out there, they use that drug because they can go to the IHS and pick it up. And so these are some of the things that are going to be coming down the pike. I know it's it's a new day, but then again, 
you know, with more responsibility, you know, we have to, you know, we basically the like scripture, much is given, much is required. And right now we have a lot of um, things going on on our reservation surrounding a lot of these very issues that we're looking at. And I, I applaud, you know, the, the, the wellness, you know, it starts at the children. You know, you want to, you know, I, like what um, Dominic and the others have, have done, you know, coming into the direction of this team here. Now, when you give a child something to be proud of, you know, they, they hold that. You know, I, I remember when we, when I, just, just by, you know, when I went out and killed, killed my first buck, I guess all of us guys can relate to that. The prayers that were said, the things that were done at that time, and then having to be told that you give that, you offer that to your grandmother, and then you become a man. You know, things like that, being, being showed how to do this, being showed why, you know, um, incorporating our culture in a lot of this. You know, a lot of these courts don't have that luxury of being able to do this. And that's why I, I you know, I, I applaud the effort that's going to be made with Judge Blair collaborating with other courts. I think that's a very good thing. I, I don't necessarily, the speaker, have any questions. I just wanted to commend them for a lot of the things that are going on and um, remind the body that there is, there is things that are going on out there. We have two people that are missing. I haven't found them yet. And God forbid, you know, this other one that they found over there in the news. I know you guys heard it. And they say he's a Native American. You know, God forbid, but there's things that are going on on our reservation, crimes. And our reservation, if we look at the map, is so vast and broad that we can have, we can have the best jurisdiction, best laws on the books, but our coverage, we need coverage to implement a lot of this, this um, recognized sovereignty that we have and jurisdiction that we um, exercise. And so a lot of the areas that we look at as far as um, concerns you know, Carrie could probably see it firsthand when she was a BIA social service worker. And there are a lot of things going on at home. And, you know, rather than, rather than um, punish the sinner, we got to look at the sin. And we got we to gotta look at other ways of, of teaching our children how to be responsible for these problems that are, that are occurring. Give them back some ownership. Show them the mountains. Go after a buffalo. Let them let swim in their, their own streams and their own tributaries and rivers and be proud of it. Let them see their own elk, their own deer. Let them be proud of it. Then maybe they won't, when, right when they drive in, right when they cross the reservation line over there, they won't come in here and say, oh, this is our land, and then they throw their trash out. I know the chairman has stated that, that, at one, that we're going to bring up, bring, uh, the old, right now, Mr. Um, Chief Judge, Your Honor, the only littering, littering law that we have in the books, I believe, is in the Fishing Game Code, where we can't throw trash off in the mountains and stuff. I think we need to expand these areas. And right now, we always say, this is our land, this is our water, and, you know, all, we talk about the beauty of it, but we all... We, we've all are guilty of it. I don't know why we do that sometimes. I've asked myself, I told my kids and my wife, I said, think about this, and we talked about it, that when we go off the reservation, we bag all our stuff. When we go to the gas station, we throw it in the proper place. We gas up, we go, and we come back onto the reservation. Whatever trash is there, we roll down the window, we throw it down. See, people do that. I'm using myself as an example, I'm not pointing fingers, but I'm just saying, when we teach our children some responsibility, like these, like these people have working hard to do, then, then in the long run, we won't have all this caseload. You know, there's, and that's just kind of something I wanted to bring, bring forward, 
that, you know, equine therapy, you know, I think we've all been involved in that one way or another. Maybe not court ordered, but we all have horses and we've all talked to our horses. And they teach us things. And it gets to a point where when you're on that horse, you're, you're one with that horse. You know which way it's going to go. It knows what, what, it, what you're going to do. <clears throat> and if they can't trust no one else, they can trust that horse. And I just want to applaud everybody for the effort. I know this is the first time the reporting. I applaud the three here, the group, the team. And I know it's only going to get better at all. Thank you, Conrad. Uh, next is uh, Duke. You have a question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Secretary, members of the body, and uh, Chief Judge, Associate Judges, and guests. Uh, あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ
ಈ ಒಕ್ಕಾಯ ಚೀರು ಪಿವಿ ಜುವಾಕು ಹೇಗೆ ಸ್ಪೂಗಿ ಗೌಸೆಕ್ಕ ಗೊಟ್ಟಾಜಿ ಯಶ್ ಮ್ಯಾನ್ ಗೊಟಾಜ್ ಕ್ಯಾರ್ ಈ ವಾಕ್ಯಸ್ ನಾಸ್ ಕವಿಗೆ ಲೇರ ಏಕಿನ್ನ ಯಶ್ ಮ್ಯಾನ್ ನಿಗೆ ಕಾಣ ಸೀಟ ಸೀಟು ಹೇಗೆ ಹೇಗೆ ಹೀಟು ಬೇಕು ಯಶ್ ಮ್ಯಾನ್ ಗಡಗೆ ಮಾ Sometimes I say no when they tell me to say no, he gives. Hey, spooky, he's going to go to that scan. He's going to go to that scan. Hey, you know, he's going to go to that scan. He's going to go to that scan. He's going to go to that scan. Pressure and look. Pressure is going to go to that scan. He's 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 going to go to that scan. He earned those white hairs. <laughs> ಎಷ್ಟೇ ಬಿಲ್ಲಿ ಹೆಮ್ಮೆಯು ಕೋಟ ಬರೆ ತೂಗೋಗಲ್ಲ ಬರೆ ಏ ಹೇಷ್ಟೆ ಅನ್ನವಿಶ್ವಾಸ ಅವಿವಾಕಾಶ ಇಲ್ಲದೆ ಅದು ಗೊತ್ತಾ ಹೇಳಿ ಅವಾಗ ಬರೀ ಬಾಚರಿ ಬರೀ ಗ್ಯಾಸ್ ಅದೇ ನವೇಶ್ ಅದೇ ಸೋತೇನ ಕರೆ ದೇಶ ದಿಗೋದಾರಕ್ಕೂ ದಿವಸ ಬೀಜ ಹೇಳಿ ಸೋತನ ದರಕಾಶ್ ಬೇಡ ಇವು ಕೌಟು ಅವರು ಪಾಲಿಟಿಷನ್ಸ್ ಕಡು ಮನೆ ಹೇಗೆ ಮನೆ ಪೂಕಾಶ ಸಮ್ಯ ಬೀಸಾಸು ಚಿಸ್ಸಾಹಾರ ಇನ್ನ ಅರಿಚೈಸ್ಟ್ರೈಸ್ಟ್ರೈಸ್ಟ್ರೈಸ್ಟ್ರೈಸ್ಟ್ರೈಸ್ಟ್ರೈಸ್ಟ್ರ
Thank you. I um, forgot to ask for a motion for recess. <laughs> Please. <to be. laughs> At the point of order, but Please. <laughs> Need a motion for recess for lunch. Motion. Motion by Daryl, second by Eric. Uh, recess for lunch. Senator. Do that, Pat.